in three weeks, we will celebrate this anniversary uh, of the founding of uh, Ecole Libre de Sciences Politiques by Emile Boutmy. And uh, the word Libre in the name of Sciences Po is not a coincidence. It's actually liberty is uh, something which was and remains an essential value at Sciences Po. Okay, okay, I have my picture. Like Matthias, I like art, and so I produced this picture, and I'll tell you why this picture has direct relevance for the subject of my speech, which will be academic liberty. Indeed, there are at least two reasons uh, for which uh, studying and practicing science politique is impossible without studying and practi practicing liberty. First, politics is all about finding compromise between individual citizens. And unless these decisions are made by one individual, Di uh, dictator or monarch, uh, we need to find compromises. We need to agree on mutual limits to our individual liberties. Second, if there is uh, no liberty in studying and practicing uh, politics, the quality of analysis and therefore quality of decisions made suffers. And that was very well understood and argued by Emil Bitmi himself. So he said that without critical thinking, and debate, science, including social science, cannot progress. So I myself, I lived in the Soviet Union, and I can t testify that. In Soviet Union, natural sciences were relatively free and prospered. Social sciences were dominated by ideology and fell behind the global frontier. And the lack of modern social science research and teaching is one of the key reasons why Putin's propaganda today can succeed in its objective of brainwashing despite Russian population being one of the most educated in the world. And this is in turn an important reason why Putin remains in power today, despite dismal economic performance and this brutal and unjust war. Now, this is why every social scientist cares about liberty, and this is why in September, in three weeks, uh, we at Science Po will have a whole series of events and conferences debating academic and civil liberties. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today. And later on, in the end of the speech, I will explain to you why this picture, which may look familiar, um, is directly related to academic liberty. Now, I have to tell you that generally I'm a very optimistic person. Uh, and despite with the experience with people who wanted to limit my own individual liberty, I'll tell you about that, um, I would like to give an upbeat talk. So I would like to say we've been fighting this battle for liberty for 150 years, we've made progress, and situation's much better today than in 1872. Now, that I can confirm. The situation today is much better than in 1872. For example, majority of our students are women. 150 years ago, they didn't have many freedoms that they have today. Most importantly, they could not vote. In academic life, not only they could not choose what to study, they actually had difficult time to study at all. In 1872, 0% of Sciences Po faculty and students were women. The first female students were actually admitted to Sciences Po only in 1919. Yet, even with that progress, today it's hard to give uh, an upbeat speech on the subject of freedom. Would be easier 30 years ago. After the end of the Cold War, I would have told you, well, many countries still remain unfree. But the idea of freedom has, has prevailed, and the third wave of democratization is bringing freedom and democracy to more and more countries. This is the famous end of history thesis of Francis Fukuyama. Unfortunately, since then, quite a few countries went back to autocracy. Now, four years ago, I would have told you, well, many countries in the world are unfree. But at least we, the Sciences Po community, we can study the unfreedom freely. We can uh, do research, we can travel to those countries, we can tell you, students of Sciences Po, what we know. And uh, this is exactly why we faculty are here and why you students are here. And to produce this knowledge, it's not only we study non-freedom and illiberalism in democratic society, we can also go to non-democratic countries as well. Unfortunately, three years ago, one of our colleagues, Faribade Adelka, was arrested by Iranian government and still remains in jail. She's been deprived of her freedom for 1,175 days today. Now, even a year ago, 
I would have told you about the trade-offs between individual liberty and public health. Uh, we would have discussed the trade-offs about limitations of individual freedoms with lockdowns and vaccinations, which did save lives. But eventually I would have told you, well, the end of the pandemic is near, and the next year we'll be liberated of masks and lockdowns. However, this year, unfortunately, many people in Europe bitterly joke, remember those happy pandemic times. Now, don't get me wrong, pandemic is and was a tragedy. Millions have died. But the situation today, in many ways, is even more dangerous. The enemies of the freedom, the enemies of liberty, have started a brutal war in Europe. Whatever the stated goals of this war, this war is about freedom. Vladimir Putin is telling Ukrainian people, if you're my neighbor, if you're a neighbor of Russia, you cannot choose whether you want to become part of Europe or not. I, Vladimir Putin, will make those choices for you, like I do for Russian people. And Mr. Putin means it. So step by step, he has removed almost all freedoms from Russian citizens. The only meaningful freedom that remains is the freedom of exit. And I myself exercised this right uh, in 2013 when common friends uh, started to tell me that uh, Vladimir Putin is very unhappy with uh, my support for Alexei Navalny, my testimony against this, uh, the imprisonment of Mikhail Khodorkovsky, and more generally, uh, my public statements against Putin's uh, assault on political uh, rights and liberties. Now, interestingly, some of common friends, albeit not all, but some of common friends told me I actually had a choice. If I wanted to stay in Russia and keep my job, I would have to shut the fuck up. Sorry for using Mr. Putin's exact formulation. Um, so at that point, I was running a university. And for the reasons I just mentioned in the beginning of my speech, I actually could not afford to do that. I could not afford to shut up. We were teaching our students modern social science, in that case, modern economics. So I had to explain to them one, why Russian economy is slowing down despite very educated labor force, despite very good ge geographical position next to Europe and China, despite very high oil prices. And so if you want to explain those issues, you have to talk about freedom, you have to talk about political uh, institutions, you have to talk about the danger of corruption. And so if I, had to, if I wanted to do my job, I actually had to leave the country, and, and uh, this is what I did. I bought a one-way ticket from Moscow and left Russia the next day. I'm very happy that uh, I've been offered a job at the Ecole Libre de Sciences Politique, not only because Sciences Po is an excellent academic institution, but exactly because here at Sciences Po we promote liberty and pluralism. And we understand that these things are very important for quality of research and education. Now, interestingly, uh, Putin's Russia was not my only experience with limitation of my individual uh, freedom of public speech. I actually had another experience I'm going to tell you about, which also taught me once more why we need to appreciate academic liberty. That you students and we professors can and actually must practice in academic institution like Sciences Po. Sciences Po allows you and actually teaches you to challenge authority, to challenge conventional wisdom. As a researcher, I can tell you that this challenging authority, critical thinking, challenging conventional wisdom is part of job description. Unless you challenge conventional wisdom, you cannot produce new ideas. Now, since uh, being a student at Science Po is your first adult experience, you may take this for granted. But it's actually unique to the academic world. So here is my second example of my own unfreedom. So last month, uh, when I was appointed provost of Science Po, I received a letter from Russian prison from my friend uh, Alexei Navalny. So as you can imagine, Navalny knows about freedom and unfreedom, probably more than most, if not all, living humans. So in this letter, Alexei congratulated me on the appointment, but also expressed the hope that I would be freer in my public speeches than in my pre previous job. So he was referring to my stint as the chief economist of a European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, that's a big international organization. Um, this is a wonderful organization, and I really enjoyed my three years there. But as a non-academic organization, it's different from a university. In any non-academic organization, government or business, the job description doesn't include, uh, doesn't encourage criticizing authority. In a corporate hierarchy, you can argue before a decision is made, usually privately. But once decision is made, you cannot challenge it publicly.
So I'm not complaining about this. I accepted this limitation of my uh, freedom of speech uh, voluntarily, not uh, somebody else, not Vladimir Putin imposed it on me. I, I learned a lot in the BRD, uh, but I would like to reiterate again and again the benefits of academic liberty. You are students, you're allowed, and moreover, you're supposed to argue. You're supposed to challenge, challenge authority, and you should cherish this opportunity. So as you see, my speech is becoming increasingly a bit, despite all the dramatic and tragic events I'm, I'm referring to. And actually, I would like to go down this optimistic path a, a bit further. So in addition to being an academic, um, uh, I, I can tell you as a political economist that Sciences Po is an institution of knowledge, and knowledge is per se freedom. Uh, Francis Bacon actually once said exactly this. Knowledge itself is freedom. Knowledge per se promotes freedom. And Sciences Po as an institution of knowledge will teach you a lot about this. So there are two things I would mention on the relationship between knowledge and freedom. First, you will learn at Sciences Po why um, uh, freedom and non-freedom produce different socioeconomic outcomes. We teach benefits of freedom and democracy. I don't have time to go in detail, but let me just remind you that prosperity and modernization are almost never compatible with autocracy. There are only a handful of rich non-democratic countries, literally Singapore and just a few oil-rich uh, monarchies. And the latter are neither truly modern nor their prosperity uh, is possible without high oil prices. Uh, in addition to data, you can just see at how people vote with their feet. We don't see Americans immigrating en masse to countries like China. But we do see people from non-free countries trying to move to Europe and United States. Europeans complain about brain drain. Some of you will probably leave Europe, but you will not go to autocratic countries. Probably you go to the West Coast or the East Coast, or if you're French, to other European countries. So there are several reasons why political freedom is good for economic growth. First one is information. Dictators can't know any, everything themselves. They suppress critical debate. They don't get feedback. So they make mistakes. So independent media, civil society, and most importantly, free and fair elections uh, provide the government with the feedback and thus improve uh, quality of decision making, including economic decision making. The Nobel Prize winner, Friedrich Hayek, actually produced a second uh, reason why democracy is good for markets and, and uh, economic prosperity. He said it's dynamic rather than static aspect of uh, democracy where the value of democracy proves itself. So the static aspects are lack of independent feedback, but the dynamic aspect is the commitment not to expropriate. Democratic societies have checks and balances that help protect property rights and enforce contracts. And that helps to provide incentives to invest investors who know that they will not be expropriated, unlike in dictatorial states where there is nothing that can protect them against expropriation. So the analysis of free and non-free societies demonstrates to the students, to you in the years to come, uh, why we need freedom and that freedom does bring high quality of life. But there is a second reason why knowledge uh, promotes freedom. We live in a society where in educated individuals are mobile. Being an academic with advanced degrees, I myself, I could afford to buy one-way ticket, quit my job, and leave my country overnight. I knew that I would not go hungry. Your education is also going to empower your, uh, yourself. When you study in a place like Sciences Po, you will become more valuable to the modern society, you will become more independent, of corporate and national borders. You can stand up to your boss, or for that matter, to the president of your country. And believe me, that really matters for self-respect, for dignity, and therefore for individual quality of life. Now, each uh, speech is a story, and each story should be built around the transformation of a character that faces difficulties but manages to resolve it, and a successful story should end up with a happy end because we want to learn how to win battles, not, not how to lose them. Um, unfortunately, despite many bit elements, my speech will not be ended on a too happy, no, no, too happy a note. We know that uh, we should protect freedom. We know why we should protect freedom. We know we've gone a long way since 19, 1872. However, around the world, there are still many powerful enemies of freedom. There are still many people, including our own colleagues, who are in prison. 
there are many places in the world where um, criticizing authority, speaking your mind, and even asking questions is dangerous. And this is why I would like to reiterate that here at Sianspo, freedom of critical thinking and challenging authority is not just an option, a nice option that you have. This is something that you really should cherish and practice. As uh, your directrice of the campus told me, I should add, practice it responsibly. Uh, so before ending on this uh, re relatively happy note, let me explain what this picture is about. So it may look like a young student like you entering the campus of Sian Spo through one of our beautiful gardens. And uh, yet it's a, it's a picture about academic liberty. How did I get this picture? I went to the Open AI Lab, which has an application called DALI, uh, where machine learning algorithm gives you a picture if you tell you what the picture should be about. So what did I ask DALI to do for me? I told DALI, please produce for me an impressionistic oil painting on academic liberty. And here you go. Here you, go. you have a student entering Sciences Po. This particular year, this picture was produced a week ago. So I would like to congratulate you. And once again, please remember, here, liberty is something that we protect, cherish, and this is a great privilege that will serve you well in this campus. Thank you very much. Thank you.